line as well. Amen? Praise God. All right. Thank you, buddy. I'm so excited about the tent revival going on behind us. Um, When we had Melissa Medina here about a month ago, she prophesied that that tent revival and and this church had some kind of connection. And uh, so I'm just... You know, if you're following online, you saw Mario Murillo maybe put out that there are active churches and pastors, not people in the secular world, but active churches and pastors who are being resistance towards the, the uh, tent revival. They're forbidding their church even to go. So they're actively working. Do you know what that tells me? That something powerful is about to happen. <laughs> So I am super excited about it. This church is super excited about it. I'm believing for a move of God through this valley that your friends, your neighbors, and your loved ones would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So the only way that they're going to come to know the Lord this weekend is if you invite them. So grab them and come, and let's fill up that tent, and let's just believe God for big things. The other thing I didn't realize until I saw the actual advertisement and you may not know who she is, but she's honestly my favorite worship leader. Like, you can think about Bethel Redding, you can think about Elevation, you can think about all the different Maverick City, whatever your flavor of worship is, but Catherine Mullins is gonna be here every single night, you know, leading worship, and she just carries fire. I'm just telling you, I've seen her in person numerous times at different conferences, And every time the presence of God just comes in such a marvelous way, that's that's another reason to go. So I just want to encourage you. It's going to be phenomenal. I'm excited about it, you know. Um, Wow. Um, Friends, this is our opportunity for me to introduce our speaker by a show of hands, how many of you were at the master class this weekend? Look around. There was probably, I think, 44 who signed up and uh, were blessed by the teachings as uh, Dr. Ed Rabarczyk took us through Romans 13. It was phenomenal. We're talking about the spheres of power and how God has instituted government and whether the church should have a voice and how to find your voice. And it was just crazy good. I love it every time he comes, he challenges me, and he challenges me to turn my brain on. Sometimes we can come to church and turn it all off and just sit there, and I love just to sit in his presence, but like Dr. Ed reminds us every time he comes, the the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. We do that pretty well around here. All of your mind, and that's where he's challenging us. Hey, you know what? Let's love the Lord with all of our mind, heart, mind, soul, and strength, amen? And uh, anyway, about my friend, Dr. Ed, is you want, if you wanna come up here, uh, he was a professor at Vanguard University for 25 years. That's where I just finished my master's at. But I knew him long before then. We golfed together in some, in some uh, Assembly of God golfing tournaments and things like that. That's kind of where we met. But he has an amazing uh, podcast called The Uncensored Unprofessor and uh, just challenging. How many of you have listened to his podcast in here? So you can see a smattering. Pulled your hands up high. I just want to see how many, because this is his third year here. Okay, there's, there's a smattering of people, and his cards are going to be on the back. I want to encourage you to listen to his podcast because you will grow in your walk with God. That's just how it is. And, and uh, yeah, so Dr. Ed is my friend, and he's been here for three straight years. But before I pray for him and turn it over to him, One of the things that we love to do in this church is whenever we have a special speaker come in, we take a special offering just for them. And we don't take anything off the top. 100% of the offering is gonna go to bless him and the work of his hands. As he is on the airwaves, just, I'm telling you, you've come under some fire, you know, and some pushback. It's interesting how 
a lot of the resistance isn't from the world, it's from other church people, isn't it? Yeah. I've seen that too. So I, he's just doing God's work online and, and growing people and discipling people. And I want to sow into that ministry. I really do. And so I'm just going to ask that you be generous. If you're making out a check, you can make it out to Bethel. But like I said, 100% of this offering is going to bless Dr. Ed and his ministry. And he'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a minute. Would you stretch forth a hand as we pray for him? Father, my prayer is that your anointing would just rest upon him as he brings the word this morning. Let the word, Lord, challenge us and transform us. Help us, O oh God, to love you with our heart, all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. Use him for your glory. And God, I bless both gift and giver today. Let a spirit of generosity be on this church, knowing that we are sowing into good ground God, I thank you that every dollar given today will go to advance the kingdom. And so, Father, bless and multiply it, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you may take that offering. Church, just be generous. Blessings to you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor Reagan. Thank you for your hospitality since I've been here. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, those of you who are here from the, the Saturday crew. Um, it was a total blast. I'm, I'm happy to report that I don't grade on a bell curve. And there were many A's that were given out yesterday. It was exciting. There were a few B's. And there are a few F's. But those of you who, who did get an F, you know who you are and why. So don't, don't be mad at me about it. I don't assign grades. I just give you what you earned, all right? So when I was in high school, I was an indifferent jock. I don't know that I was a dumb jock, but I was an indifferent jock. I took all the easiest classes. I took the minimal requirement. I didn't take anything hard. I had no aspirations other than being a, a baseball player, and my plan was to go into the Forest Service and my saying that is not a knock on anyone who's in the Forest Service, right? But the Lord got a hold of my life, and to my surprise, I became a nerd. And I, I learned how to love to learn, and the Lord said, I want to use you in ways you hadn't intended, and, and I, I had no, it was nowhere on my horizon that I would ever get a PhD and be a teacher. But I fell in love in part of why that happened is I fell in love with learning. And one of the things that I realized that I like to learn about is the past. My wife and I went camping a, a few summer. We go camping every summer, but we went camping down in a place in central Idaho where there is a ferry crossing on the Oregon Trail. And these people risked life and limb to try to get their horses and wagons across at this ferry point. Well, there's a, there was a discovery center, a heritage center nearby, and went in there and saw all the artifacts, and I ended up reading three books about the Oregon Trail, and I'm like, those people were awesome. It's amazing to know what they went through and the hardships they endured. The same thing grips me when it comes to Scripture. I like learning what people went through in the past, not just because it makes it more real, it's just because it captures my imagination because I'm going through something. We all go through things. They went through things. And in the ancient world, 3,500 years ago, God delivered the Hebrews out of Egypt by parting the Red Sea and then by stopping up the River Jordan as they crossed in, right? It's amazing stuff that happened. And centuries later, Psalms shows that they're still remembering what had happened. This was central to their identity. If we could have that, yeah, beautiful. And the psalmist writes, when Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion or kingdom. The sea looked and fled, Red Sea, the Jordan turned back, the mountains leaped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled? Why Jordan did you turn back? Why mountains did you leap like rams, you hills like lambs? 
Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool when Moses struck the rock, and he shouldn't have, but the water came flowing out of the rock. Just nod your head as though you were listening with me. Thank you. A hard rock in the springs of water. The ancient people were terrified about water. Water was a powerful, powerful entity, and that hadn't changed when Jesus came on the scene. Centuries later, after the psalmist wrote 114 in Mark 6, 45 through 51, Mark writes that immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because the, all, they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed. Sometimes that word amazed gets translated into terrified. And they were terrified not just because they saw a ghost who now got into the boat with them. They were terrified because he calmed the storming sea. And the ancient people had this tendency to view raging rivers and storming oceans as like a weapon of chaos. It was a terrifying thing to be out on the sea or to, to be caught in the sea. Some people viewed the, the, the raging waters as an evil sent from the, from the gods, the little G gods, or on my podcast I talk about them as archons, these gods that had to do with what God was about. Or sometimes they viewed these, these creatures of the water as something from the underworld. Monsters lived there. Leviathans lived there. Chaos lived in the deep water. And not, this was not something that was just in Egypt or Mesopotamia or the Mediterranean. If we go up north, we find that in the, the Greek and Roman cultures, they also viewed the water as gods, right? Poseidon or the, the god Aquaman, right? People, come on now, don't be. But three people just woke up, uh, Aquaman? Now he's on to something. <laughs> Water is viewed as a scary thing. When I was in college with a bunch of guys from the dorms, we went down to the beach. And before I got in the water, a couple of my buddies said, hey, there's a riptide today. So if you should happen, you probably won't, but if you get caught in the riptide, don't try swimming straight back in. Go off to the side and come in. And we're out there body surfing and having fun and body surfing and having fun. And suddenly I realize all my buddies are out of the water. And I'm like, I need to go back in. And as I start to go back in, I can't move anywhere. I'm swimming, I'm swimming. I'm 21. I'm young. I'm lean. I'm strong. I'm a good swimmer. I, should be, I, can't, I can't swim in. And praise God one of my buddies up there on the beach saw me swimming like an idiot instead of going out to the side and coming back in. I'm thinking I'm strong enough to do it anyway, and I'm starting to get tired, and he ran and got a lifeguard who threw me one of those lifeguard thingies. I think that's what they're called. <laughs> a lifeguard thingy has a, a rope and a, and a round thingy. And he towed me in, and by the time I got up on the beach, I was, I was terrified. I'm like, I think I was going to drown. Water can be terrifying. Water can be refreshing, right? Going to the beach is a fun thing. Water can be a great thing, or water can kill you. In the Bible, water is held out to us as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus offered life-giving water to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Or we're taught through the scriptures, and we experience it this morning in worship. You guys know how to worship. That's good stuff. It's good that you pause to be present in the Lord. 
We can have waters of river, river, rivers of life, that water flowing inside our soul. It's a spiritual water that can renew our broken hearts, right? Water can be a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a beautiful symbol. Water's miraculous. Water causes life to flourish. But water can be destructive. Those poor, poor people in the South, North Carolina in particular, that got devastated, right? I have, I have a supporter who lives in that part of the town, and their, their basement got flooded, and they were happy that they were only that their basement got flooded and that their house wasn't washed away. Ever have mold in your house? Please, please no, right? It's a terrifying thing. Or a tiny leaf in your roof can ruin several nights' sleep. You can have water running behind your drywall and ruin your living room. For five years, I worked in the commercial flooring business in, in Southern California, in Orange County. We specialized in building Carl's Jr.'s and Jack in the Boxes, but we would also go into fancy, fancy, fancy restaurants and do repairs in their kitchens. You could have some exotic kitchen where... It'd be at a restaurant you can't even afford to eat at. Never ask what's going on in a kitchen back there either. When I, when I did that job and we'd go into those kitchens, I'd think, and, I'm, and I eat, like, I don't want to see you prepare my food. I don't want to know what's going on back there. Just bring it out to me and I'll eat it with a clean conscience, right? But water can ruin the most exotic kitchen. Water on granite will eventually efface and mar that granite. So when's water good and when's water bad? It takes discernment. It takes discernment. You don't just drink out of that creek up in the Sierras. You might get Giardia. You need discernment. We have to discern. And what I want to do with you today is to say, in the ancient world, they had to discern with regard to water Today, we have our own challenges as we discern the culture we live in. Culture today, on that next PowerPoint, culture today is analogous to water for the ancients. It's a mixture of good and bad. Now, there's a lot of good, for example. There's cultural goods like civilization and roads and lights and libraries. Here's a weird one. I asked my wife the other day. I saw a brand new library going up in our community, and I said, do we still need libraries? It's terrible. It's what a weird thing because we're so, we're so digital now. Everything is so in our, right in our, in our phone, right? Do we need libraries? And part of me thought, yes, we have to have libraries because there's nothing like holding a book, the tactile nature of it. I'm such a clod that I still put my notes on paper instead of just putting them on my phone like people who are way smarter than me, right? There's good and bad to culture. There's things like libraries and community and education and music and art and police and order and peace and logic and medicine. There's so many good things to culture. And it's, it's great to lean into those and celebrate those. But like water, culture is mixed and layered. And that may be more true now here in America than at any time in 240, 300, 400 years. There, it's a mixed bag. We need to discern it. We need to discern the good from the bad in culture. Because the deal is, you guys, we now live in a post-Christian world. I grew up in a Christian world. Pretty much everybody was familiar with the Bible. Pretty much everybody was familiar with the Ten Commandments. Pretty much everybody's familiar with decency and respect. And you address adults. I was taught by my parents, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, Mr., Mrs., some sense of respect. You hold doors for women. Even that sense of Christian culture had flowed down through the layers, but now we live in a post-Christian world. There's little respect. There's little awareness of the Bible. It's a post-Christian, post-biblical world. 
About four weeks ago, five weeks ago, I went to Costco. I needed to get the tires rotated on my truck. And normally that takes them about 45 minutes to an hour. And I always take a book, usually a theology book, and I'll sit there at the super nicely appointed Costco snack area with those plush fiberglass torture racks that they call that they call sitting tables, right? And I'll get a, a soft drink or occasionally a piece of pizza or those, those chocolate and vanilla swirlies. Mmm. Anyway, I'm sitting there. This time the guy said, hey, we're really slammed today. It's going to be two hours, not an hour. I'm like, okay, well, I got my book. I'm sitting there reading, sitting there reading. This elderly couple came up. Not saying something because I'm old. <laughs> this elderly couple came up and said, hey, it's really crowded in here. Do you mind if we sit right here? And I said, no, no problem. Have a seat. He was in a wheelchair. So she went off to get the, the food. And when they came back, they, she, she sits down and they look at me and they go, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a theology book. And she says, theology, is that... Is that like religion? And I said, yeah, well, it's about God and life in light of God. And we started talking. They had, they, they have a, they live on, in New York State and they come out to Idaho for four months every summer. And they have a beautiful home up in the Ketchum area, which is a three-hour drive from where I live, but this is the nearest Costco, so they come down, and they load their vehicle back, and they go back up to Ketchum, and so they said, what's it like to be religious? And I said, well, you guys know people who love God, right? They said, well, not really. I mean, we went to college, and she said, my favorite class 60 years ago, was a, a class on comparative religions that I took, and we end up having a, a 10, 15-minute conversation about God and what that means and why I'm religious, right? And they were just completely exuberant. It was weird. They were like, this guy believes in God. I was like I was a rare bird that they were encountering at the, <laughs> at the zoo or something, what, what on earth is going on? We live in a post-Christian world. We are out there amongst people who have no idea about the existence of God or what he means or that the Bible's relevant or any of that. And, and what's happening, you guys, is that America is being corroded by poisonous water. We are now being washed over with cultural poisonous water, if we have that next slide the poisonous water of neo-Marxism and Darwinian theory as an all explanative narrative. There's almost been nothing as corrosive as Darwinian theory because it gives people an out for belief in origins and therefore an out for belief in God. We are watching to my weird dismay a kind of strategic sexual confusion you guys, are, you guys have it going on here way more than up in Spudland. When I first moved to Idaho, um, ever watched any of you nerdy enough to ever have watched that comedy uh, series called Portlandia? Yeah? Well, when I had watched it too and thought it was funny and weird and zany, and when I got to Idaho, I, I decided real early to call it Spudlandia. Because we got some really weird things going on up there in Idaho. But you're seeing it greater than I am, this strategic sexual confusion where people are grooming children. Say, what? What is going on? That's some poisonous water. Or where we're being taught that we need to be tolerant as a celebration of sin. We aren't just saying, hey, you do you, I'll do me, live and let live. Kind of, I grew up with a live and let live, but now there's no longer live and let live. It's you either celebrate me or you're a hater. You guys know this. I'm not saying anything explosive to say that. That's just on all, all around us everywhere. Or we're watching an ever-expanding nihilistic secularism. Nihilism is the belief in nothing. 
a secular nothing. And study after study is now showing that the younger a person is, the more likely he or she is to be hedonistically secular. They're only interested in their own pleasure. That you stop and pray for these kids, that you make a point of being intentional about your kids' experience in church is 180 degrees off from what the poisonous culture is trying to do to kids. God bless your ministry to children, right? And all of these weirdies, all of these poisons have their seductive selling points. They have their seductive selling points, right? They're being sold to us as, but if you embrace this, you'll, you'll enjoy love. If you embrace this, you'll, you'll enjoy for the first time. For the first time, you'll enjoy freedom. If you just look at life like this, you'll enjoy power or Holy smokes, now everything's being sold to us as a matter of, if you'll just embrace this, you can enjoy utopia. Anybody selling utopia, you run for the hills, right? Because they don't understand human nature. And people are by the droves disaffiliating with the traditional church. And we are being taught by the culture to keep our faith in the privacy, the privacy of our own homes. And guess what? Now after... 20, 30, 60 years of that drumbeat of keep your religion private. Keep religion in the closet. Don't bring your religious experience. Don't bring your identity in Christ out into the public square. People are doing it. People are staying home. They're keeping their faith at home. They're keeping it in a box. And so the number of nuns the number of nuns, N-O-N-E-S's, is growing. A study by Arizona Christian University shows that the number of nuns, those who embrace no religion now in America, is 23% of the population and growing. Well, it makes sense if the culture's saying, hey, we don't want religion out effective among us, people are going to put it in the closet, it diminishes. The, the number of duns, D-O-N-E-S's, which means no more church attendance. And I promise you, everyone in here knows someone who still thinks of themselves as a Christian who said, I'm not going to church anymore. That didn't happen out of nowhere. They didn't come up with that idea out of nowhere. It is a cultural trend to stay home. I see Pastor Regan on Facebook Every Friday or Saturday, hey, it's getting close to go to church. Go to church. It's good to be at church, right? He's bucking against that cultural trend of, oh, you can just stay home. And those of you watching today at home, God bless you. You have your reasons, and your grade will go from an A to a B. But <laughs> you have your reasons, and God bless you, and thank you for tuning in, right? The younger the generation is, the more post-Christian they will be. And this is sorrowful. Because I've, I've been saying on my podcast for five years now, I'm concerned that our post-Christian culture is more powerful than the Christian faith. That's a weird thing to say. But when I'm watching what's happening in people, I'm concerned that the seductive nature of all these weird values is being more powerful than the Christian faith. Now, we know we don't, we don't agree with that, but it's having an effect upon people. My, my ultimate concern is people are losing their faith. And that's going to affect their eternal destiny, among other things. Mercy. So we face challenges from our mixed cultural configuration. But then if we can believe it, parts of the federal government seem to want to shut the church down. You guys lived through it here. So do we up in... Up in Spudland, we watched as COVID shut churches down. Some of them never reopened. This is a weird one to me. The DOJ is spying on Latin Rite Catholics? I, I have my theories. <laughs> I have my theories on why Latin Rite Catholics are a threat. Because what? why else would they be spied on? It's not like Latin Rite Catholics own guns at a greater percentage than someone else. Something weird's going on there. And every time I read something like that, I think, what the, what is going on here? Pro-life supporters are being arrested and threatened with long prison sentences? Wait, what? There are parts of the federal government that oppose the church. 
what do we do? I want us, my plea, that, my plea this morning is we need to be as cunning as serpents. We need to be as clever as serpents. We need to discern, hey, is that good water? Hey, there's a, there's a breeze kicking up on the water. Could that lead to a storm? Hmm. Hey, that, that sounds seductive, but it's off base. Let me step back and evaluate that. We need to turn our discernment on, or in New Testament Greek, our diacrino, our sorting, our sifting. We need to learn to sift the good from the bad and be more intentional about that than ever because the world spirit is devastating Christian faith. And and I don't want to only land on the bad, but I want to do a kind of smell the smelling sauce, church, right? Despite all of that, we know that the majestic lordship of Christ does not stop at the boundary of culture. PowerPoint. We know that the majestic lordship of Christ does not stop at the boundary of culture. Even though the culture tells us, hey, keep your faith at home, which now it even gets nervous that we're doing that at home, right? Keep your faith at home. We know that Jesus is, um, the scripture shows he's the Lord of everything, and everything includes, includes the culture. The majestic lordship of Christ does not stop at the boundary of at the boundary of culture. We're going to speak truth and grace regardless of what our culture says. We're going to bring love and charity and hope and hope and hope and light and deliverance and order to our culture as a gift, as a love offering, regardless of whether it likes it or not. For those 25 years, especially the 15 years that I taught full-time, some student would come up to me after a lecture and say, hey, professor, I really like that lecture. Can I meet with you in your office? Yeah, let, sure. Schedule a time. They come in, and for the first three or four minutes, they'd use the lecture as an entree into talking about something that was personal in their lives. And half the time, they would end up talking to me about how their faith was being challenged at a Christian college, and they'd be in tears because they were learning things in other classes that was deconstructing Christianity, and and my initial reaction is to get angry and irritated, like, who's doing this at a Christian school, and why are they getting away with it, and why would you do that to somebody, and right, but I think this, this, is, this is diabolical that you would come to a Christian college and lose your faith. Or now, holy shnikes, since COVID broke, which just caused all kinds of cultural unrest and chaos, I have watched dozens, I'm afraid hundreds, of some of my best students, students who wanted to study the scriptures, Students who wanted to dig into their faith. Students who would do extra work in the midst of all that as they were trying to dig into their faith. I've watched them turn their backs on Christ and turn their backs on the authority of Scripture and turn their backs on a Christian posture with regard to life. And they have been turned by culture. Culture is powerful. And it makes me wonder if they had learned how to discern the good water from the bad water while they were at school. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when they come on to my page. I I never go on to someone else's page and say something snarky. I just don't. They've come, people have come on to my page and said the most ugly, vile, accusatory things, and I'll think... You were never like that with me in the classroom. What has happened to you? They've been poisoned by bad water. That culture has been powerful in their hearts and minds. Celebrating wickedness? What on earth is going on? We live in an angry, post-Christian culture. So we need to be mindful of that in our mission. Our core is always the gospel. That's never going to change. Our core is always the gospel. That's not going to change. Who we worship as Lord is Jesus Christ. That's never going to change. Right? 
But we have to be more clever now than before. We have to be more serpent-like, Jesus imagery, not mine, than ever before. Parents, I have three adult children, four grandchildren. Parents, you have to be more mindful now than ever before in what's going on with your children, particularly their education. You need to be asking them, what, what's going on? Let me see what you're learning at school. We need to pay attention. We need to discern and teach. We have to name evil for what it is. I do that on my show. And Reagan said it. Uh, people get mad on my show. If they are getting angry, they're probably Christian. Because on my show, I say, um, this ain't right. I'll say things like, this isn't right. This is, this is not helpful. This is not healthy. And when you say things like that, people get upset. God, in the garden, God gave Adam the ability to name the, at, the animals. Genesis 2. God gave Adam the power to name animals. God has given us the power to speak truth to evil. God has given us the power to speak grace and light to evil. Part of our calling. So it's time to stop pretending that our culture's rip current doesn't want to drown us. It wants to drown us. Frankly, you guys, this isn't in my notes, but I believe our nation is on a precipice, and I believe the church is on a precipice. And God can do amazing things. I'm praying he does amazing things. But we're on a precipice. And history can go one way or it can go the other way. So what do we do? We resist. We resist. The Bible teaches us over and over and over to resist. Let me give you some examples. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. Stand against the wiles of the devil. And, and we saw this word yesterday in our study of Romans 13. When Paul says stand against the wiles of the devil, he's not saying like, hey, church, you need to get up and stand. And you go, oh, okay, okay. Paul, that verb that Paul uses there for stand with stand is like, I'm ready. My feet are planted. I'm, I'm standing on the rock. I know what I believe and why, and I'm ready to resist. It's an active, proactive, attentive, almost ready to pounce kind of standing. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Struggle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, this present darkness. Withstand the evil. Stand firm. In case it wasn't clear the first time, let me say it again. He says, stand firm. Keep alert. Or here's one. Exodus 23, 2. The wisdom of the scripture is so amazing to me. You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. Go. I got to have a drink of water. Holy smokes. What? <laughs> Exodus 23. Does Exodus 23 understand the human heart or what? You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. Do not side with a majority to pervert justice. Whoo. Wow. When that one popped up in my digging, I went, that's a zingy one. <laughs> or back to Ephesians 6.13. Having put on the armor of God, stand firm. Or Romans 12.9. This can't be in the Bible. This cannot be biblical. This cannot be in the Bible. Hate what is evil. Oh, if I said that on my show, I'd, have, I'd lose 25 people. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. That's Paul in, again in Romans, the book of Romans 12, 9. Or James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we resist. How can we resist? First, speak the truth. I'm grateful for some of these social prophets, among whom I include Jordan Peterson. Any Jordan Peterson fans? I'm grateful. 
I have all kinds of philosophical questions and so forth with him, but I'm grateful that Jordan Peterson is emphasizing that we need people who speak the truth in culture. Talk with anyone who will listen, or especially to quote my good friend Mark, talk with people who matter about things that matter. Talk with people who matter about things that matter. Truth is under siege. Here, we, it's, we don't only live in a post-Christian society, we live in a post-truth society. That's a Jordan Peterson observance. We don't only live in a post-biblical society, we live in a post-truth society. It's so weird. Speak the truth. You don't need to be a prophet to speak the truth. Just matter of fact, gently, graciously speak the truth. How else can we resist? Teach your children. Don't assume that what they're learning in school is benign or harmless. When my kids were in science class, I'd say, hey, can I look at your science book? Yeah. I'm skimming through their science book, skimming through their science book, checking the index, checking the index, checking the index. Evolution, 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 evolution. Evolution shows up 12 times in the textbook. It's never once said that it's a theory. And so I'm sitting down with my kids. Hey, I want you to be aware of something. You're going to learn about evolution. That's fine with me. I don't care at one level, but you need to know it's a theory. Here's why, da, 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 da. You got to sit down and do things like that with your kids now. Do not take it for granted. Be intentional with it. Make it fun. Hey, tell me what you're learning. Why do you think they're teaching you that? Why do you think they're saying it that way? Be intentional with them. It's not like you need to stand and do a sermon with them. Ask them questions. Read through their homework. Get them to think aloud with you. Ask them questions like, well, what gives them the authority to say the way they're saying it? Grandparents, right? Again, I'm so privileged to have four grandkids and a fifth is on the way. Whoever knew that the payoff of being a parent would be that you get to be a grandparent. (laughs) Grandparenting is fun, right? Parenting. God bless you, parents, because you won't, you'll never do anything harder. It's so important. But grandparents, speak into your grandkids' lives. When you're together with them, give them a little nugget. I play little games in the car with my grandkids when we're riding along together. I play one game as who made that, God or man? Who made that, God or man? I'm trying to get them at a foundational level to recognize that some things God creates and other things men make and a lot of the stuff that we Enjoying life is a combination of those. Why is it that we can have a truck? Why is it that we have food? Get them to start thinking simple ways about reality. It's a very, it's a real challenge on our hands. Minimize the risk that your kids are going to be captured by, seduced by doctrines of demons. If you preload them now, it'll be way easier later when they're going through the grinder. What else? Pray. Arguably, our most powerful weapon is prayer. Pray. Pray for your kids. Pray for your neighborhood, your town, your church, your county, your state, your nation, your your pastors. Again, Regan and I were talking over the last couple days how often I wake up in the middle of the night and I just feel a sense of, it's Ed, you got to pray. I was praying the other night. I was laying there, didn't know why just kind of feeling unrest in my spirit. I'm laying there praying in tongues and praying in tongues and praying in tongues. I'm like, I don't even, I don't really even discern what this is about. And the next morning, Iran shot, what, those 200 some missiles into Israel. I'm like, Lord, did you wake me up to somehow get involved in that? Prayer is not just us talking to God way up there. Prayer is a partnership. Prayer is work. Prayer is part of the co-working that God gave to us at creation. Prayer is part of the fundamental nature of the fabric of the universe. That we partner with God, we can change things through pray. What else can we do to resist? Are your seatbelts fastened? Don't Make sure not just that you have your lap belt on, but make sure that you have the strap, the shoulder strap on for what I'm going to say next. Because some of you are going to get whiplash. Call out politicians who promote wickedness. What did he say? Call out politicians who promote wickedness. 
They need to be told what they're doing is wicked. You can do that respectfully. You can do that politely. You can do that professionally. You can do that graciously. You can even tell them that'd be a good thing. I'm praying for you. They need to know that they are accountable to God for what they do with their power. You can say that in a gracious way. You can say that in a polite way. You can say that in a generous way. You could even tell them you're praying for them. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. When my dad, across the last few years of his life, he died in December, when my dad would say to me, Eddie, I'm proud of you. Like, my dad's proud of me. Those words are powerful, right? When we just look at somebody and say, hey, you matter to God, you don't know how that can plow into their heart. When you, when you say to the powers, hey, that ain't right, we don't know how they're going to respond. We can call them out. We can be salt. Finally, you guys, today, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord even over culture. Jesus is Lord even over nations. He's the Lord of America, whether America realizes it or not. One day, America, Matthew 25, I will gather the nations in front of me like the sheep who gathers the goats, and I will separate them with the goats on my left and the sheep on my right, and then I will ask them, what the did you do? I was going to say hell, and I thought, you can't say hell at church. What did you do with what I gave you? He's going to say that to the nations. Jesus is Lord over America, even if America doesn't know that. And I am grateful to live in America. Pray with me. Lord, fill us with your grace. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your truth and your salt and your light. You called us to be witnesses. We want to be faithful. We want to do that with joy. We want to do that with creativity and playfulness and zeal and and love. So come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Come raise up your church. Wake and shake and sift your church and raise up a remnant. Wake and shake and sift your church and raise up young lions for the glory of Christ and his kingdom. And everybody said, amen. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I think the core of what the Holy Spirit is speaking over this church through this whole citizen series that we've been in as we approach this coming election is that the church needs to find her voice. I'm reminded in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Thank you, Dr. Ed, for challenging this church. It is okay to send your politicians emails. It is okay to speak up and say, that is not right. But one of the things I have told you is long before you speak up, you better be prayed up. Because the problem in the church is if you do speak up and you don't hold the heart of God on the matter, you become impotent. And you become this clanging gong. There has to be love. Speak the truth in love. And I love what Dr. Ed just brought. Speak up. Be prayed up. This is our moment. Amen? Amen. And in this series, as we've walked through what it is to be dual citizens, you are all citizens of America, and it's our stewardship to God to... That is, he he has entrusted this great nation to us. It is our responsibility to vote. And too many Christians, I think, what is it, 30 to 40 million are going to sit on the sidelines this year. If the church would rise up 
we could swing the elections. You might say, what are you saying, pastor? The church should legislate morality? The church should do... I'm telling if the church is silent, the only voice on the playing field is this culture. And the poisonous, toxic water will be drank by everyone. So what am I challenging the church to do as we head towards elections? Be prayed up. Let your voice be heard. You may have never voted before. I want you to vote. Last week I brought a message called Be Calculated because I felt that was the heart of God, the Holy Spirit. He was challenging this church and challenging us all. Why do you vote the way you do? We want it moored, anchored to the word of God. We want to vote biblically. Not, we don't want to go along with the trope of culture where people are being poisoned and hurt. So I'd like everybody to stand as we close. This is the Last part of our citizen series. We're actually going to break into a new series this next week, this next month, and we're going to look at healing and we're going to be going into, you know, our God is a, a healing God and we're going to see miracles. We're going to pray every single week for people who are hurting and broken. So you want to bring those. We're going to talk about inner healing. We're going to have a Sozo Sunday. The next whole month is going to focus on healing. I'm super excited about that. But this is our moment to stand together, united, and pray. Pray for our nation. I love this nation, and I want things to go well. I believe the church should pray against any kind of corruption, that it should be exposed. You have never heard me espouse from this pulpit and endorse this candidate or that candidate because I want us to be citizens of heaven first. And I want you to vote a certain way as a citizen of heaven. I've told you my personal opinion based on scripture that I will never vote for any candidate, red or blue, who votes and is pro-choice. I am not... I'm, I am a full pro-life supporter first. We can argue about economy. We can argue about the best way to accomplish this or that. But if you vote for a politician who is pro-choice, you are enabling, I believe, a genocide in this world. I am unapologetic. I know that one out of four women, and so there's probably even many in here who have had abortions, and I know it's a complicated, nuanced issue in regards to the pains and the issues of life. But let me tell you, I challenge you, read Psalm 139. And God can forgive you, and God can forgive this nation. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, Repent and seek my face. I will hear and I will heal their land. It's time to pray. So my two big issues as I vote are I vote pro-life only. And the second thing that I vote, I vote for the politician who supports Israel because I read in scripture, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray that it would go well with Israel. Those are my two starting points. And, and the reason why I am that way is because my voting is anchored, I believe, to Scripture. I want to challenge you as you approach the voting booth, as you approach your ballot, to ask yourself, why am I voting this way? Be calculated. Amen? All right. Well, if you're mad at me, tough. But we can all stand united, and we're going to pray for our nation. We're gonna pray for the election. We're gonna pray for our politicians. We're gonna pray for our leaders on both sides of the aisle. We're gonna pray for righteousness and revival in America. And that's why I'm so stoked about the tent that's out the back right here. I'm believing God for revival. Amen. Would you bow in prayer? Father, I thank you that when we put our faith in you and our trust in you, 
that we became part of your great family. We were grafted in to the great Abrahamic covenant that we actually are grafted into that great Israel nation, the covenant people. It's amazing to think. But God, you have placed us as dual citizens of heaven and here in America, and we know that we are to steward what has been entrusted to us. So together as a congregation, Lord, we pray for the blessing of our nation. Father, I repent for the sins of this land. I, I repent for not speaking up when I should, for not being active when I should. God, I, help me to be a good steward and help me to capture your heart. Help me to be one who would speak up to the unrighteousness that is going rampant through this nation. But Father, I believe that our best days are ahead of you if we would turn to you. So God, I'm asking for revival in America, revival in this nation, revival in our state, revival in our families, revival in our churches and the pulpits. God, I'm asking for a move of God that would sweep across this land, a move of holiness, where you would capture our heart and the hearts of the people would be turned to you, that you would capture the gaze of our hearts. God, that's what I'm asking for. And so God, as I approach this election, I wanna vote with integrity. Help us, oh God, give us wisdom. You said in your word, if we lack wisdom, we could ask and you'd give it. So Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. You said in your word that your sons and daughters are those who are led by the Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would lead us even as we go into the voting booth. And I pray that every candidate who is voted on God would have your heart. And I know God, that's a big ask so hard because every candidate is flawed. There's not one person in this earth who is perfect. On either side of the aisle, we're all flawed before you. But God, I know you can strike a lot of straight blows with a crooked stick. If you'd pick up that stick and put it in your hands. And so God, I pray for our nation's leaders that they would make righteous legislation I pray for the leaders who are diabolical and choose to divide and are corrupt and are selling out our nation. You know our hearts better than we do. And God, I pray that darkness would be exposed, evil would be exposed. God, I ask for fair elections because I want it to go well in our nation. I speak blessing over America, oh God. I believe you that our best days are still ahead of us as we humble and submit to you. God, not only do I wanna be blessed as I live in this land, but I want my children and my children's children to enjoy the freedom to worship in this land. So Father, I ask right now that you would have your way in these elections. I ask right now that the church would stand up, speak up, and vote biblically. God, I ask for blessing across America. And God, we stand together and we say no to any chaos, no to any radical, uh, agenda that would push forth and, and riot and cause disrest in this land. You told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and I also pray for the peace of America, oh God. So bless our nation and bless this church. Help us to be good stewards, good managers of what you've entrusted to us. Give us wisdom and let us represent your heart. I ask this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said,
Amen. God bless you, my friends. Like I said, we are going to be jumping in next week into a new series of healing. You do not want to miss it. There's going to be signs and wonders that take place. God bless you. You'd help us by picking up your... Thank you for joining with us today. If this message impacted you, remember to share it online through Facebook to Larry Bethel Church or YouTube to Larry Bethel TV. If you want to view any previous messages, you can find them on YouTube as well. If you need prayer or want to reach out to a pastor, you can connect with us on the church app under Connect. Isn't our church amazing? I just love Bethel. I'm so glad you came to church to be with us today. Have a great week.